This is video number eight of the Aggregate Demand and Aggregate Supply series, which is part of Unit 2.2 in the IB Macroeconomic Syllabus. In this video, I'm going to explain and discuss the shifts in the long run aggregate supply curve, LRAS, as well as an introduction to supply side policies. This is only an introduction to supply side policies, as in one of the future units, we will talk about them in more detail. Essentially, the learning objective for this lesson is to explain using both the monetarist neoclassical model as well as the Keynesian models, so both of them, Keynesian models, how factors leading to changes in the quantity and or quality of the factors of production um, can shift the aggregate supply curve over the long term. These include improvements in efficiency, new technology reductions in unemployment and institutional changes. So this is the learning outcome for this video. So what are some of the factors that shift the long-run aggregate supply curve, whether it's Keynesian or uh, monetarist neoclassical? What are some of the factors that shift the long-run aggregate supply? These are the factors that essentially increase the productive capacity and the potential output of the economy. They are the same factors that would cause the country's production possibilities curve, the PPC, to shift outwards. Um, basically, they are factors that change the quantity of the factors of production and or the quality of the factors of production. So any improvements in efficiency can shift the long-run aggregate supply curve to the right. New technology can also shift the country's productive potential outwards. Reductions in unemployment, um, if, if the labor force is increasing and more and more people are working, over time, aggregate supply will increase anyway. Institutional changes that allow the economy to be more productive, like maybe deregulating um, the power of trade unions because they are charging artificially high wages. Um, all these sorts of institutional changes can increase aggregate, long-run aggregate supply. Any investments in infrastructure, um, building better air, road and rail networks or better communication networks. Discovery of new natural resources, this will increase the quantity of factors of production. Having a larger workforce, perhaps maybe due to migration. So when you allow more and more people to migrate, your labor force will increase. Obviously, in the long run, this increases your long run aggregate supply. Improvements in education, in training and work practices, which improve the quality of labor. So these are all things that might lead to changes in the quantity and quality and or quality of the factors of production and hence increase the productive potential or the productive capacity of uh, the economy. So what does that look like in each of those models? Well, a shift of the long-run aggregate supply curve in the new classical or monetarist flexible wage model will look like this. Okay. The uh, long-run aggregate supply curve, which is vertical, it's uh, inelastic and independent of the average price level, will shift to the right. And the opposite is true if um, something happens that causes the long-run aggregate supply curve to shift to the left, like a destruction of uh, lots of natural resources because of a major war or whatever. Uh, with the uh, Keynesian sticky wage model, this is what the shift would look like. So here is the Keynesian sticky wage model. Uh, the long run aggregate supply curve looks a little bit different, but again, it's a, if, if it increases, it shifts to the right. Um, if it decreases, it shifts to the left. So it's the same idea, but these are the factors that would cause the long run aggregate supply and hence the productive capacity and the potential output of the economy to shift. Now, it's very important to note that shifts in long-run aggregate supply are caused by changes in the quantity and or quality of the factors of production, and therefore changes in the productive capacity, these are very important keywords, and the potential output of the economy as a whole. So they are very similar to shifts in the country's PPC. Please do not forget these keywords like potential output or full employment level of output or productive capacity when you're talking about shift in long-run aggregate supply. So this brings us to the concept of supply-side policies. What are supply-side policies? Basically, they are government policies that are aimed to increase the quantity of factors of production and or improve the quality of factors of production 
and hence increase the productive capacity of the economy. These are supply-side policies. There are two broad um, groups or two broad approaches to supply-side policies. There are interventionist supply-side policies and market-based supply-side policies. What's the difference? Interventionist supply-side supply side policies, they are based on the idea that the government has a fundamental role to play in actively encouraging economic growth, that the government should intervene and actively encourage economic growth. This can be done through investment in human capital, for example, building better public universities and better public schools, investment in research and development and new technology, investment in infrastructure, building better infrastructure, better communication networks, uh, better rail networks, better airports, ports, and so on, or passing... Uh, Implementing industrial policies that promote growth, like tax cuts, for example, which would encourage uh, investors to invest more, and subsidization. These are all interventionist supply-side policies. What about market-based supply-side policies? Well, these are policies that focus on allowing markets to operate more freely with minimal government intervention. They may also be described as institutional changes because they affect the structures, institutions, and the rules that govern economic stakeholders. Okay, So institutional changes or market-based supply-side policies, they focus on allowing markets to operate more freely. Uh, they are institutional changes that allow markets to operate more freely, like um, implementing policies to encourage competition, uh, to encourage more competition in your industries. Reforming the labor market so that maybe um, there isn't a, a, an artificially high minimum wage or there isn't too much power in the hands of uh, uh, trade unions and, and, and labor unions, which might artificially raise uh, the wage rate and therefore um, do not encourage businesses to employ a lot of workers. Or any incentive-related policies to increase workers' incentive to work and businesses' incentives to invest. So creating any sort of policies that would encourage workers to uh, work harder and businesses to maybe invest a bit more. These are market-based uh, supply-side policies. Now remember, both uh, Keynesians as well as uh, new classical or monetarist economists, both camps or both schools of thought encourage the use of supply-side policies. The only difference is that um, the neoclassicals prefer just supply-side policies. They are not uh, proponents of uh, gut policies to change the level of aggregate demand. They believe that it won't affect the long-run aggregate supply. It will only affect the average price level. Uh, Keynesians, on the other hand, believe in a combination of uh, supply-side policies and demand-side policies. We'll find out more about this um, in the next couple of videos. So, to sum up, supply-side policies aim at positively affecting the production side of an economy by improving the institutional framework and the capacity to produce. Therefore, they shift the long-run aggregate supply curve to the right. Now, some factors to consider when asked to evaluate supply-side policies in terms of strengths and weaknesses. The first thing is there are time lags. It, there is time between the implementation of supply-side policies and actually uh, seeing the benefit. Uh, they only work in the long term. That's why they shift the long run aggregate supply curve. Um, they do have a very high ability to create employment because obviously if the productive capacity of the economy uh, increases, there would be more job opportunities. They do have the ability to reduce inflationary pressure. So that's one good thing. Um, they have a very positive impact on economic growth. Uh, this is really how an economy grows, with the whole productive potential increasing. Uh, they are very costly, and remember, because there's a time lag, they are very costly, and they have a very high impact on the government budget. So the government is restricted in terms of what maybe infrastructure it can build. Also, there's an opportunity cost, because this money could be spent in other places. Uh, they can have an effect on equity, sometimes too much labor market um, deregulation or reform, can end up hurting workers who work in unskilled, um, low-skilled jobs who need trade union protection. And they also can have an impact on the environment. So how much um, uh, infrastructure is built will also affect the environment. So these are all factors to consider when you evaluate the um, strengths and weaknesses or the pros and cons of supply-side policies. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.